Welcome back to another session of the PFRPA podcast. I'm so excited about today's guest because he happens to be a, a personal hero of mine, Mr. Jackie Slater. And Jackie, before you talk, I got to tell you this story. Okay. Okay. When I was playing ball, I was watching your game film. Now, you didn't retire all that <laughs> all that earlier than me, but I was watching your game film through college and through my NFL days to model myself after wow. the consistency, the playing ability of Jackie Slater. So to have you here today wow. on this podcast with me <laughs> after all of these years, it's awesome. Jackie, thanks for Glad to be out. with you, Brian, and I'm honored. Uh, you know, it's, it's refreshing to me now. Uh, when I meet guys like you who tell me things like that, because you know when I was in the right in the middle of trying to have a career, it wasn't about uh, modeling anything. It was right, all about right. holding on to a job and getting your <laughs> job done. And you know, I just uh, I, I just didn't think about those kind of things. That's crazy. Hey, so I've been talking to you now for the past year or so as we've been working with the PFRPA. So it's been exciting for me to actually get you here that we're in the same place at the same time to get you on the podcast. Well, it's cool. Awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad to be here. So your storied career so let, let's 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 take it back a little bit and we're going to talk about playing days and some of your favorite memories but oh, man. For, so like I everybody knows your your hall of fame career it was amazing 20 years in the national football league first of all 20 years, man. Wow. <laughs> you <laughs> make my back six hurt. Years, after six years, <laughs> <laughs> it's just killing me. Tw 20 years in the NFL. What, wow. what does that mean to you to make well, that accomplishment? It, it, means a, it means a great deal. I, I'm honored every time I think about it. I feel so fortunate and blessed to have had the opportunity to, to do something that I love for that long. And, and uh, though it was, um, you know, there were scars along the way, uh, different things, injuries and whatnot you have to deal with. I was... I was fortunate enough to be healthy enough to train and to play the game and to practice the game, and uh, it, it was just a utopic environment for me, and, and I'm, I'm forever grateful for the opportunity I had. Huge blessing. So, what, you know, your success on the field, what do, what do you credit your success to? Oh, without, without any doubt. I mean, I, I, uh, I, had, I had the unique um, physical talents. I was fast. I was quick. And I was strong. I had, and I was prototypically built. I had the, the weight that you needed to carry that time to be successful, and without limiting your mobility. And I all attributed, I attributed all of that to being blessed with it, you know, yeah. from my mom and dad. And then also, uh, I was also blessed with a, with a, I don't know if, how to describe it, but it was a, somewhere between a passion of, of total failure and a passion of wanting to be the very best that you could be that, that just kept me uh, fired up and motivated to do, you know, the mundane and the little things that yeah. you had to do to be successful. You don't just show up in, in the National Football League uh, on talent and win and be successful. You have to build on that and yeah. with your knowledge and with, your, with the understanding of situations. And, and, I, and I made those things a priority and, and it was a blessing. And that's a huge point. I think, um, um, a lot of fans, you know, because they never see that part of how mundane training can become the discipline to do those mundane things day after day after day is, is huge. They, I mean, they see, they see Sunday afternoon, right. Or Monday night, all the glitz and glamor and celebration, but the dedication and the determination, mm. It, it takes a lot. I mean, you, first of all, you got to have a passion for to play the game, to love the game and the nuances of it relative to your position. It's, as an offensive lineman, you know it's a very technical position, and if you go there relying on any particular God-given ability that you have, that God-given ability will get you fired more than anything, quicker than anything else. <laughs> yeah. So what you had to do was understand that, yeah, you have the physical ability to do this, but you need to have the mental acumen to – to to use that properly to 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 enhance that to to increase your strength to increase your quickness to 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 increase your awareness of situational football as it relates to your job so yeah. that you could do it at a very high level and be competent and so my goal as i played the game was it it, it got to be where winning and losing the game was not my priority 
my number one priority was having our football team win the game in my position. And, and that's what my goal was. Uh, and if we won the game, it would be great. If we lost the game, you know, I didn't feel so bad uh, because if I was doing the things that I was supposed to do, then I had done all that I could do. Yeah. And I was limited, you know, right, just right. to play my position. Right. Yeah, it's a powerful way to think about it. So a lot of folks know some of your 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 big accomplishments. And I think, you know, I'm going to start with one of them. I think it's amazing, especially, the you know, in the free agency world that we live in today, that you played all 20 years with the Rams, the mm -hmm. same team. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but 19 of those years were the L.A. Rams right. in just one year. Yes. Uh, back in St. Louis? Yeah, I played in the, actually in the L.A. Coliseum for four years, in Anaheim Stadium in Anaheim for 15 years, and then my last season I played wow. in St. Louis. Wow. That, I mean, in that world of free agency, I mean, it just never happens anymore. Well, I think actually, it's a testament to you as a man and yeah, as a player. It, I, I actually did get the opportunity to participate in free agency. In fact, uh, um, when free agent, the first year of it, I got a phone call from the Atlanta Falcons after Chris Hinton, the all-pro left uh, the Falcons and went to Minnesota. Uh, they had Lincoln Kennedy and Bob Whitfield, two young, highly touted tackles that weren't, you know, they were still young. And actually they wanted me to come to Atlanta, not so much to play, but to, to mentor and teach these guys how to be pros and, and all of that. And so I went for a visit there and they enticed me and offered me a contract. And so I, I'm thinking, wow, this is, but the reality of it all was uh, the, to have the opportunity to participate in free agency, I did, in that uh, I decided to go back to the Rams and tell them that the Falcons wanted me and this is what they were offering and da 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 and the Rams chose to uh, sign me to keep me in Los Angeles. So the benefits of free agency, I actually got to, to participate in, even right, though right. I didn't, you know, not like in today's dollar, but I, I saw the results of it. Right. So all of us guys that have had the the privilege of playing in the National Football League we all have a favorite memory or perhaps a few favorite memories oh, wow. of playing the league so but what i want specific with this one and and i'll preface it with this um i have a favorite memory that nobody else would really know about and mm -hmm. and mine was I'll, I'll give it to you in a nutshell mm -hmm. it was my rookie year and it was a Fourth game of the season, I believe, and we were playing against Green Bay Packers. Mm -hmm. Well, Reggie White. <laughs> as you know. I, somehow I, I, I wondered if Reggie was a part of your favorite memory as well. <laughs> so, yeah, right? If you've survived Reggie <laughs> as an offensive tackle. Oh, right? man. So I, what happened with mine was the week before, he played against another rookie tackle with the Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. And he got like six sacks in one game. Mm -hmm. So – we're the next game going on national television because people are thinking Reggie is going to break the all time sack record in against, two games by <laughs> the fourth game of the year. And so they're like, you know, DeMarco, what are you going to do? How are you going to hang on and make it through this game? And I'm like, hey, well, listen, I, you know, I'm a player too, having yeah. some pride, right? Um, but they're like, oh my gosh, Reggie's going to destroy you. So, anyways, I, you know, it actually, you know how it goes against playing against Reggie, especially the first time you're going to play against him. You're studying weeks before. Yes. <laughs> you know, you're watching that film and breaking it down. That's right. And, and you get the three rules, right? You don't curse at him, you don't take the Lord's name in vain, and you don't <laughs> chop block him, right? <laughs> well, you I did know. All, I did all three in the first quarter, by the way. Oh, you did? So, let me tell you my Reggie, my, my awesome Reggie story that nobody would know. So I make it through the game, and I only gave up one sack, right? I, I was like, just, I remember the last seconds ticking off. I just wanted the game to be over. We lost. I was like, I made it, right? I'm, I'm walking, jogging off the field, and we're going to our side. They're going to their side, right? As always, they always do. And I see out of the corner of my eye, I see big number 92 running across the field, one jogging, like he's running at a good clip. Uh -huh. I was like, I wonder what Reggie's doing, right? And he keeps coming closer to me and closer to me. I'm like, he's gonna come over, he's pissed at me. He wants to fight me. Like, uh -oh. I was like, I'm like a fight Reggie. Rut row. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah, right, seriously, rut row. <laughs> so he comes over to me and he smacks me on the backside. He goes, kid, you did a great job. You're gonna be wow. okay. Wow, how about that? Shook my hand and ran off. Like the fact that he took the time to come over effort, says a lot. 
across that field. I'd like to see that film, man. You must oh have had gosh. a heck of a game. So it was – it was my favorite, my most favorite memory of my my NFL career was that moment, and especially back then. This is before social media and all this, right? So yeah. Nobody would have seen that. No, nobody would have seen that. You know, the fans are already clearing out. Yeah. Right? And they had that moment. So what is your favorite moment, your favorite memory? Wow, yeah. man. That, 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 you know, I got so many. I got so very many, and, I, and certainly Reggie White, uh, is at the center of, of two of, of <laughs> Dude, two of two or three of seriously. those, and and and, and yeah. I and I, I could think of one other one, but I will share you share with you this story about Reggie White. The first time I played against Reggie White, uh, we played Philadelphia, and we had we had the lead. Uh, Jim Everett was our quarterback. We had the lead, and they took the lead with about three minutes to go in the game, and we were in Philly, and uh, we we're, we're we're moving the ball down the field. And all of a sudden, uh, it was a third down situation, and we had gone past midfield. And I walked to the line of scrimmage, and there's Reggie sit sitting over there. So I looked at Reggie, and I said, okay, short, dumpy guy, a little pudgy looking. I said, uh, you know, it won't be. I, I treated him like, you know, he's not a speed rusher. And most of the guys, most of, they don't put big guys like that out I'm here in, in yeah. the space. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I'm getting ready to take a playoff on a crucial down. So <laughs> I, deci <laughs> I, I decided to really tax the chubby guy by at the snap of the ball, flying off the ball as quickly as I could to make him, you know, tax himself running to catch up just to get to perimeter, right. you know, edge. I flew off the ball, but as I flew off the ball, he was going just as fast. I didn't know he was that fast. And he was rolling at a speed that some of the 240, 45, 50 pound guys were running at. Yeah. Well, as I eased out to him, while I was going back on my intersection angle, I put my hands on him. And this is the way I remember it. When I hit him, I saw him run in front of me back towards the guard, run into the heart of the pocket, hit Jim Everett. The ball came out on the ground. He landed on it and recovered the fumble. And then I landed right over there on the grass. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the air. How many of us? <laughs> he launched me into humble. the air, and I, I it was all I could do was watch. I mean, oh, that was my totally. Gosh. So I, totally I mean, I got destroyed. the same thing. I literally, I think the back of my shoulders hit yeah. the ground first. I'm like, I'm 320 pounds. Yeah. He's not throwing me. Right. Yes, that's exactly launched what he me did. He launched me. <laughs> It was that hump yeah. move where he just oh, yeah. squeezed in close. In, he squeezed close to you, and just when you start leaning on, he eased that arm out and then just and try to explain th to your people throw that, you right that, past that him. hump move. The difference between balance is you being here and you being here. Yes, <laughs> it's like it's so yes. small. very small, and it was like he could feel it or yes. sense it the yeah. right time. Well, he dictated that. He dictated that success in that people underestimated his speed, and when he got three and a half yards wider and use that speed running up the field on third and long or second and long, most offensive tackles are going to sit off the ball with some speed once they realize he has it. I didn't know he yeah. had it, but when he yeah. took off, I'm thinking, I got to go. Oh, yeah. And so uh, then by the time you get to him as a tackle, you're so light on your feet and so focused on speed and moving that the power aspect comes to the table a little bit later. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. his power is already oh, in motion, gosh. and he, he uses your momentum against you. <laughs> <laughs> just devastating. I it mean, is. I think every offensive tackle that ever played in that era. <laughs> if, if you, <laughs> hey, listen, listen you're not worth your salty sweat if you haven't been humped by Reggie White. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> do you remember, too, the other one that got me, uh, do you remember Jumpy Gathers? Oh, do I remember Jumpy yeah, Gathers? come on, man. Down at the Saints? So, oh, Whoa, my. With the forklift? <laughs> the forklift. Good gracious of life. I, I, fortunately for me, he played inside over the guards. They used him exclusively almost. Yeah, to to yeah. to go you know when I played against to go over the guards and get yeah, vertical yeah. push in the heart of the pocket, and I can remember like it was yesterday. Dennis Hare and Doug Smith, you know, all pro guys, heavy guys down inside, just yep. being hoisted up off the ground and walked back on their tiptoes into the heart of the pocket, and yeah. and it was I'm it never, was the most first. humbling pass rush. <laughs> I, I ever saw was the way these guys were getting was, carried around. It was one of those things, like the Reggie moment, where you're going, there's no way. I'm 6'7", 320 pounds. He's not throwing me. No. It's, it's the exact same thing. And jumping, the first time he experienced it, he said, by then, they, um, we had 
made some changes in Jacksonville. Leon Searcy was brought in from the Steelers. Yeah. I moved right guard. He was at right tackle. Mm-hmm. And and here we go. And and here's Jumpy. And I get hit with a forklift that I've yeah. never seen the move before. You, never see, you know, the funny thing about it was he just came and stood up and he kept his and arms just, cuffed. And yeah. then he just went right underneath you in your chest and – and buried you. And like, just, I'm like, I didn't know what to do. By the time you figure it out, you're up on your tiptoes. Yes. Right? Yeah, it was just an unbelievable oh. move. So, yeah, oh my gosh. That's, uh, and that was just straight line power. Power. Because he was like six, seven and a half, six, yeah. eight. It seemed like yeah, he was yeah. very tall. Weighed about 315 and something like that. So he was tall, linear, and strong. Strong. And he and he was efficient, too. He just. But if he got inside you. Oh, you were dead. You were done. It was, yeah, yeah. Uh, quarterback was on his own because you weren't going to help. Even if you managed to take him down on top of you, if you managed to cinch down on this, it still made you look so bad. bad. It made you look bad. It's like it one made of the you look most like you need to get in the weight room. <laughs> right, right. It's like one of the most embarrassing things ever. You know, it is. I always pride myself, you know, the big – Big bench, big squat, yeah, and all this stuff, yeah. and then, then all of a bam. sudden, bam! <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah, <laughs> did I learn nothing? Oh my <laughs> right? goodness! Those those were two amazing That's physical awesome. specimens, and uh, you know we're seeing a lot of guys like that now. Fletcher Cox, I think of uh, Akeem Hicks at the Chicago Bears. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know the big kid that left. Uh, uh, he was at the Denver Broncos, I believe, and now he's down at um, Jacksonville. Yeah. I can't think of his name right now. But just big, rangy, tall, strong men inside that can just – unlike, you know, Aaron Donald, who's just dynamically quick and explosive and right. change direction on a dime, these are just big, powerful men that can feel their way through the rush, apply weight and mass and power <laughs> to you when just when it needs to happen. <laughs> right. You need guys. and. I don't know if I could block some of these guys nowadays. <laughs> the you moment what. you think you can, you know, because we all have that moment in our minds where after we're retired, we're like, I, I could, I could go back and play. I mean, no. I could do it with these guys. I didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you played twenty years, right? You didn't have to. It, it was like when I, at the end of my career, it wasn't like it was time to stop playing. It was like, are they going to slow the train down and let me walk down the steps, or are they going to just kick me off while it goes on? <laughs> oh my gosh! All oh, right, man. so, so let's let. let this is amazing, and I could I could talk to you about these memories forever, man. I'm, I'm so enamored by you know just your you know your career and what you've done, what you've accomplished. Well, thank you. I was blessed, no let's, doubt about it. But let's 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 talk about something I know is is really near and dear to your heart, mine as well. And I want to talk about I want to talk about pension parity, and I want to mm-hmm. talk about fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Lisa Marie, oh, okay. uh, who we both know personally, and, mm-hmm. and how. First of all, let's, let's talk, what's the issue? Let's let's educate folks on what the big issue is here, right? Uh, well, I think the big issue is is, is quite simple, and uh, and the, and a simple thing about it, it makes it so relatable to people living in our country, Americans in general, is that, you know, you work at a job, um, you 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 have inherent risks at that job. It's understandable. But you also have expectations. If you're committed to doing that job, whatever it is, then you want to be compensated for it. And, yeah, there was a generation of guys in our country who, yes, they were compensated for the work, nowhere near the level that they're being compensated now. But unlike the current guys who are protected with uh, with, – you know, concussion protocols and yeah, because we're talking about pre nineteen ninety three. Yeah, all kind of all kind of right? protective uh, procedures sure. that kept them out of harm's way for long term problems. You know, those weren't in existence for several generations of guys in the National Football. Many of those guys were the foundational building blocks of the success we're seeing in the National Football League right now. And to see those men, those men languish uh, away with the. Uh, with a with a with a, a, a wage a retirement wage that is not, um, you know, not very good. Yeah. And then also to have that compounded by the fact that they are limited because they weren't protected from the chop blocks and weren't protected from the blindside blocks and weren't protected from the concussions that occurred and they're having consequences which limits their ability to go out and actually work. To see that situation is, to me, is is, is very sad. And, um, you know, I personally, I, I commend Lisa Marie Riggins and her efforts over there at FAIR, uh, a FAIR um, 
fairness for work, fairness you know, against uh, fairness against, against athletes in retirement. Yes, I, I commend right. her for, Fair, for for her work. <laughs> fairness for, for athletes, athletes in, retirement. in retirement. There we go. I, I commend her for her work because uh, she is uh, you know championing the cause for some men who who have a lot of pride. You know, you don't you don't play and have a success in the National Football League that that you had that I had and. And unless you have a measurable amount of uh, pride about your work ethic and your preparation and your ability to compete against the very best uh, talent, physical talent in the world, you don't, you, you don't, that pride doesn't go away when your body fails to be able to play the game. And so a lot of those guys uh, are languishing in these situations and they won't say anything about it. You know, it's just like when I got my nose broke and when I got concussion I didn't talk about it because it was a badge of honor to get your bell rung and then go back out and keep playing I mean I thought I was doing something I thought I was tougher than the next guy it was a competitive edge for me but little did I know that uh, all the long-term effect of concussions you know that they're they're problematic for guys like me now and other guys as well Uh, it won't be for my son it right. won't be for guys that are playing now because if you get dinged, you're going in concussion protocol. And so it's, it's, it's good to see that. I'm happy uh, for the current guys. I'm also happy for the, them and the money that they're earning. It's, it's, I think it's fantastic because they do generate a great deal of this money with their performances and putting their bodies on the line. But I think that those young people need to look at, at the men that came before them you need to look at how it was before free agency, what had to happen to get that. And they need to look back at the guys, um, uh, their living situations right now, and they need to, relative to the collective bargaining agreement, they need to address that. And I think people with this whole program, so again, fairness for athletes in retirement, and this is all about pre-93 retirees. Mm-hmm. To, just to kind of explain this in a little bit more broader sense and in comparison, the NBA mm-hmm. uh, and Major League Baseball all have their program for pension parity. So if it goes up for one, it goes up for all. And there's a sharing aspect there. And I think that that's one of the things that, that we're talking about here is, is we don't want something that's unusual. It's not, it's not any different than any of these other leagues are doing and, and you know, we're just saying, hey, listen, in recognition, especially, you know, with where we are in the NFL coming up on our 100 year anniversary mm-hmm. in recognition of these men that built the game that allowed you and me to live out a quality of life. Right. Mm-hmm. And to because we all know this, too, that it's not just about these players at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. It's about their families as well. Right, correct. correct. It, because the, somebody's taking care of this guy, mm-hmm. right? I, I was part of that when I was injured. You know, my mm-hmm. wife taking care of me. So there's just a, a. It's just about to me, in my opinion, it's about doing the right thing. Just correct. Just do the right thing. It correct. is the right thing to do for these guys. They've paid the price. They, they were the foundation of building this league to what it is today. Correct. And we just have to recognize that and do the right thing. Well, I mean, I, I agree. And, 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 I, and I do think, uh, you know, guys who, you know, guys like you, you're a lot younger than me, but you can look and see how your situation uh, ended up and some of the things you went through. And, and I'm sure on occasion you thought, well, what about the guys that didn't have even some of the protections that you had? Right. You know, you mentioned that you had a couple of years of health insurance after you were done. Well, most of my career, the men that left the game, uh, they had nothing after they were done. So they had to put the bill on the insurance, either via paying out of pocket or get jobs. And they had families, and they were still young men. Uh, nowadays, that's not the case. The union's done a fantastic job of, uh, of yeah, no uh, covering doubt. those guys. They have five years of health insurance yeah. coverage. They have a certain amount of money that they can use to pay premiums on health insurance beyond that. And so the union has... And, and uh, the league has has collectively agreed to do something for those guys, and I think it's fantastic. It's just unfortunate that um, uh, our union or nor our 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 administrative uh, heads 
have been able to <clears throat> rectify the fact that, hey, listen, we're making more money now than we ever have. Uh, we're going to make sure that the current guys get taken care of. But, but we, why don't we you know, show America that we, are, uh, we have a conscience, uh, yeah. we understand that there is a generation of players who didn't have these opportunities and who were not protected with, 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 uh, with concussion right. protocols right. and all of the other uh, safety measures, uh, limiting chop blocks, blind side, all, they didn't have those protections and they walked away from our great game um, <clears throat> with an inability to get jobs or insurance and, and they played a decade. Yeah. And some of them in the Hall of Fame and um, so they have, in my opinion, it's just a matter of those two uh, branches, management and the union, yeah. making a decision of whether or not they're going to reach back to those guys or if they're going to sit back and just hope that they die off and the problem goes away. So there is a collective bargaining agreement coming up in 2020, right, where we can, we can have an opportunity to right some wrongs here and mm -hmm. uh, get the pension parity we're talking about. Yeah. I just, you know, we, we know there's some, some crucial things that need to take place during that time. And one of them is educating today's players mm -hmm. on just, hey, one day you're going to be a retired guy as well. Yeah. Uh, but educating them on these players and why we should take care of them. And I think, and this is even public perception, and you know how this is. So if you put, they, people assume mm -hmm. because you're an NFL player, you're, you're just worth millions, right? Mm -hmm. You made millions of dollars. And, and for these pre-93 players, you played back in the 60s, 70s, <laughs> 80s. Like, millions of the, dollars. Yeah, these guys. Are you kidding these me? These guys had other jobs, <laughs> you know? They were, they were teaching or they were, you know, oh, working they, construction. We all did. We all had other jobs. And, in fact, uh, during that particular time, we played six preseason games, and and a lot of the, the current guys said, "Why would you play so many preseason games? We don't need all that to get ready to play." Well, the truth of the matter is, they don't, because the current guys have the luxury of being able to uh, train year round. Well, as soon as the football season was over, the most prominent players on the Los Angeles Rams in 1976 went directly to second jobs. Uh, there, there was no. Yeah. Uh, take a week off and yeah. then get back in the gym, do some running here, a little bit of rope, n none of that. You went to your other job and you were responsible for a different set of employers. And so <clears throat> to compare what's going on today with what was going on then is, it, yeah. is, is, is not. And I, and I think that's, I think that's going to be part of the, the battle, this public perception of understanding how important it is that folks kind of stand behind us and that these guys, this is, you know, and you know how I feel. I've had my personal, um, my personal injuries and stuff that I've dealt with. But I know that every day that goes by, every year that goes by, there's another player. Yeah. That we. It's, well, that it's just like we got to be able to improve that. Yeah, well, it's just like I said earlier. Uh, if you look at the powers that be, the men who have the opportunity to to address the situation and. Those men are obviously owners and, 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 and the Players Association management, council, management Councils, but it, it, to me, it's guys like Roger Goodell. To me, it's guys like Demarius Smith. And I, I met both those men, and I, know, I don't know them intimately, but I've had conversations with both of them, and they've both expressed to me a sincerity about wanting to write this, a sincerity about understanding, understanding how these men are languishing and understanding how they've benefited all of us uh, in their efforts. And I, and I legitimately believe that they want to do something. And uh, to me, it's going to come down to, you know, whichever one of those guys decide uh, and convinces his constituents, either all the owners on Rogers' uh, behalf or the players, uh, the, the active players and their management council on, on, on Demario Smith's side, which of these men are going to convince their constituents to allow them to stand to stand up and tell America that we we're going to right this wrong, we're going to do the right thing, and and I and I, I full well uh, expect that expect that to happen. I I, I really. I really want to believe that this is something that's going to be taken care yeah, of. Yeah, you know, I've heard uh, other guys talking about that sincerity uh, with Goodell and Demory Smith, and and you know, knowing that listen, all all the problems aren't theirs, right? They they're Correct. they're new to this as well, relatively speaking, to the length of the league, and 
and the I just look at the the amount of changes that have made just just over the last ten years mm-hmm. um, to benefit guys after the game has been incredible. They're they're going in the right direction. They're doing a lot of really great things. Um, I think this one. I think this one gives them an extraordinary opportunity to be a hero for a lot of people. I think so too, and I'm and I I'd like to buy the the one that steps up first and get it done. I'd like to buy him a drink, yeah. <laughs> maybe even a bottle of champagne because right. you know it's a it's a grave issue, and uh, you know it would very it would be very easily for the two uh, heads of power that has to make this decision to shake hands and say we're going to let them die off. And that will handle that, and yeah. we'll just take care of our, our current constituents and let the business roll on. That would be very easy to do, and right. nobody gets the dirt or the mud on their faces. And, and as they would agree to, the guys would just, the problem would die off That's and right. go away because we're losing. About 150 a year? We're losing like about that. 150 uh, former NFL players every year. And every time you lose one of those guys, it that's one paycheck less that our pension money has to go toward. So uh, if it's not addressed, it, it, it won't yeah. be an issue in a matter of a few years. Yeah, well said. Jackie, what an honor it has been for me. Man, Seriously, me after too. all these years uh, me too. You know, of uh, watching you play, studying how you move, how you do things. Well, Just thank you. The opportunity for me to sit here and interview and talk and hang with you like this has been amazing. It's been cool, man. I mean, I, hey, listen, at my age, anybody remembers what I did, I'm always <laughs> delighted. Always there you delighted. Go.